With the recent comeback of the Satanic Panic and my recent discussions of Satanism on my channel, I've seen a conspicuous rise in claims that I am influenced or even possessed by demons. Now, I'm flattered that these commenters are clearly so impressed with my content that they're forced to conclude I have supernatural powers, but I'm sorry to say that I don't. It's, it's a one-man operation here. But what if I did want some help? How would I become possessed? Well, I started looking into it and rather quickly realized that the answer is complicated. I mean, yes, if you go to a religious official or expert exorcist, then you'll get a fairly simple answer. But go to a different religious official and you'll get a different answer. They'll tell you what their specific sect's current doctrine states and leave it at that. But that doesn't account for the fact that doctrine in all faiths changes over time, or that different faiths have equally rich traditions on the subject. This is why I decided to look to non-sectarian scholars of religion for help on this. They're interested in understanding what traditions exist and how they interact with the world, not furthering their specific religious beliefs. A practice which ensures one's cognitive bias in study, really. Because exploring ideas of possession in all faiths would be too much to pack into just one video, I'm going to focus on Christian tradition and its evolution here. At the end, we'll go over risk factors for possession so we can determine my chances and yours for being possessed by demons. So, let's speak to a couple of scholars. First up, Dr. Justin Sledge of the channel Esoterica. He was a fan favorite from my How to Go to Hell in Every Religion video, and he has a particular interest in demonology, so you know I had to have him on again for this one. All right, well, first of all, thank you very much for coming on. People really liked our last interview on my channel on the uh, How to Go to Hell in Every Religion video, so very happy to bring you back on. Thank you very much, Drew. That was a really, that was a lot of fun. Um, uh, yeah, I love it. I love the question, like how to get to go to hell. We, we don't think about typically how to go there, but um, it's a fun question. But You might be told to go to hell, but most of the time no one provides detailed instructions, so I just wanted to fill in the gap there. Absolutely. I think you're doing everyone a, a great service. Thank you. I want to talk first about our oldest recordings or, or texts of demonic possession or some kind of spirit possession. What are the earliest or some of the earliest records of something like spirit possession in history? So we can separate history and prehistory here. And there's some pretty good reasons to believe that in prehistory, uh, spirit possession was probably a, a, a big part of religion. Um, this is easy to refer to as shamanism, and we see it pretty ubiquitously across uh, the world, especially in hunter-gatherer societies. So there's lots of reasons to believe that that actually predates uh, history uh, for who knows millennia. Although when we get into history, our earliest accounts, of course, come from uh, the earliest people to build civilizations, and uh, the, those are going to be people over in what is now uh, southern Iraq, the Sumerians. And uh, in their literature, uh, especially in their medical literature, they have a, a wide variety of um, forms of spirit possession that that could happen. And uh, typically that's their going theory for medical illness. Uh, almost every form of medical illness in the in the Mesopotamian world was typically um, thought to be re the result of, of spirit possession of, of various kinds. So you have a whole host of different kinds of creatures that could possess you, could, could even possess certain parts of your body. And they had really elaborate rituals for um, getting rid of those uh, sp uh, spirits as well. Um, we see something very similar uh, actually developed also in Egypt, although I will say that Egyptian medical technology was much more naturalistic. Of course, they also engaged in a great deal of, of um, exorcisms as well, but from their surviving records, they tended to, to have some mix of spirit exorcism and naturalistic medicine, whereas in Mesopotamia, it's much more heavily leaning in the direction of, um, of, of spirit possession. So and they had very detailed rituals um, for for expelling those expelling those demons let's explore some of those rituals what was exorcism like in that context i've heard that it wasn't um hey you evil spirit get out of here there might be some appeasement or some more complexity there than we might think of today what, what was exorcism like then it was a much more of a, a negotiation uh in this case these creatures are pretty powerful and so you would do things like uh you would compel them and, and you would use Things like incense, sometimes sulfur, burning of sulfur, forcing the victim who's been possessed to inhale sulfur, which you can imagine just must be awful. That tradition, by the way, will persist for thousands of years. It is amazing how long that tradition will last. Um, you could also compel them through negotiating with them. You could offer them things. Um, and typically, you would offer them um, 
a range of things. One of the things you might uh, be dealing with, dealing with also are, are dead people who have come back and possessed people. That would be a case where you would need to uh, offer them some kind of uh, ritual uh, offerings or something like that to you know to make them stay dead. You don't want the dead coming back. So it was a combination of of ritual affairs. You could also use demons against other demons, which is an interesting kind of uh, technique. Jesus is accused of using that technique in the New Testament, using one demon to drive out another one. That was a very common technique. The most common, most famous example of that in the ancient world was that, uh, as you can imagine, crib death uh, or um, what we now call SIDS was a, just as common then as it is now, unfortunately. And protecting children from demons, especially the demoness Lamashtu, was, was an overwhelming concern in the ancient Near Eastern world. Lamashtu was a very powerful demoness and you needed to protect your children from her. And a pretty common way of doing that was actually using uh, the demon Pazuzu, who's most famously known from the movie The Exorcist, uh, using Pazuzu to scare off Lamashtu. And so we have lots of uh, instances where pregnant women or uh, women who had just had children or young children would actually hang up uh, plaques or heads of Pazuzu to uh, shoo away Lamashtu. So this is a great example of where you might use one demon to drive another one away, which is uh, it's just something very soap opera about that. I like the a demonic soap opera as much as the next guy. So you have a, wi a wide range of, of techniques, uh, herbal techniques, um, um, incenses, um, incantations to drive away several different kinds of demons. So, and you had technical experts. Uh, the Apishtu is your go-to person uh, who's uh, sort of translate what an apishtu is, they're probably something like we might translate them as ritual expert, but I think exorcist would not be a completely off the mark translation for what they do. So you're saying that there were demons or possessing spirits, I should call them, that weren't thought of as all bad. They might be in some ways allied or useful to humans. Can we explore that a little bit? Yeah, so there are some spirits that aren't inherently bad. In fact, you could even become possessed by gods. Um, more, a, more, a common version of this is that prophets would often become sort of quasi-possessed by supernatural beings. And all kinds of things can happen. They could be made to speak, they could be made to convulse, they could be made to uh, utter things about the future and give uh, oracles. What's really fascinating about those oracles, at least in the ancient Near Eastern world, is that uh, if you were possessed by one of these gods and then you gave an oracle, they would take your oracle to the people that would uh, check it against other forms of divination, for instance, uh, liver divination. They would inspect the, the lobes and shapes of a liver to figure out the future. And they would actually, they, would, they had methods of, of checking you. So it wasn't just like you said a bunch of interesting, maybe insane things, and the king just did what you said. They would actually check your, your uh, revelations, your oracles based on other forms of divination. So it's interesting seeing that happen and then being like, oh no, the liver says this guy's wrong. So. Um, one of the more interesting things that uh, Ishtar could do is that Ishtar could uh, flip the gender of male prophets to a specific third gender, a gender that wasn't female but wasn't male. It was a specific Ishtar prophet gender. And we don't know exactly what that entailed, but they grammatically became different. And so all kinds of interesting things could happen in the, and they could flip your gender back to, to male. We don't see instances of women being flipped to the Ishtar gender. It's only males flipped to the Ishtar gender. So another interesting example of how spirit possession can alter one's uh, place in the world and also alter one's station. You could be a relatively normal, middle class, even lower class person, but if you were gripped by one of these spirits, um, rich and powerful people could take interest in what you had to say, especially if what you had to say was something about the future or um, you know, oncoming plague or, or something like that. If a person wanted to become possessed, let's say hypothetically in that context, how would they go about doing that? At least in terms of being possessed by the gods or um, emissaries of the gods, uh, you'd want to sleep in one of their temples. Incubation is a technique by which one um, would uh, sleep inside of a temple and become possessed by one of the entities that dwelled in that in that temple. That process, by the way, has never gone away. There are still churches where people go sleep inside them in order to get um, visions from saints and things like that. Uh, incubation has been a thing we've been practicing for several thousands of years here in the Western world, still practice it. Um, the other easy way of getting possessed by demons, just getting sick. 
uh, or being born with the malady, epilepsy, of course. Even the word epilepsy literally means to grasp or to shake. The idea is that something from the outside is doing this to you. So if you're born with a, an illness like epilepsy or if you come down with an illness, uh, any range of fevers, most demons would be named after things, and this is true of the, of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, where you have demons like Resheth and Dever. Their name means plague and fever. And so just getting sick was the easiest way of getting possessed by a demon because, again, their medical theory was wrapped up in the idea primarily of, of illness. So all things told, I don't know, drink some not great water, and you'll probably get a demon. Okay, how did this early tradition of demonology influence Judeo and eventually Christian demonology? So what's really fascinating about the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament is just how demon-free it is. If you look at the Hebrew Bible as a piece of literature, which it's, a, it's pieces of literature, we should think of the Bible as a, as a collection of Israelite literature. What was actually shocking about it is that if you compare the amount of demons or malevolent spirits or whatever you want to call them, um, to their Egyptian neighbors and to their uh, neighbors to the to the east, the Mesopotamian culture, the Hebrew Bible has very little in the way of, of demons. You have very little there. A couple of mentions of things that scholars even debate now, whether they were demons or just birds. We're not even sure exactly what they were. And so the Hebrew Bible typically is free of them. What is interesting, however, about the Hebrew Bible is that in the few cases, and I'm thinking particularly of two cases here, where we have a case of spirit possession, one of them being Saul being possessed by a ruach, ra'ah, evil spirit, and then another case in uh, the second book of Kings where uh, the prophets of Ahab are actually possessed by a, a lying spirit, a spirit of deception. In both of those cases, the entity that possesses them is sent by God. So it's not an inherently malevolent entity, or if it is a malevolent entity, it's not an entity sent by a devil figure. There is no devil figure in the Hebrew Bible. It doesn't exist yet. It's sent by God. So the Israelite God might be responsible in both those cases, or is responsible in both those cases, for the two cases of negative fear possession. In the case of uh, Saul, it makes him uh, mentally ill. He attacks people. He attacks David several times. In fact, David's playing of the harp is the only thing that seems to calm this down. Uh, eventually, it leads him to get himself killed. And in the case of the prophets of Ahab, or Ahab uh, it leads to him uh, mistakenly going to the battlefield where he shouldn't, and he is killed. In fact, the entire episode is just about uh, Israelite God trying to get this Israelite king killed, and he does it by basically sending a lying spirit into the, uh, into the prophets. And um, so that's just a fascinating element where we think of negative possession as associated with the devil because of how we're influenced heavily by Christianity in our culture. But at least in the Hebrew Bible, the buck stops with God. Wow. That's, I, I've read all of that. I've, I've read through the entire Old and New Testaments pretty thoroughly in my religious days, but that's not something that I ever picked up. That's it, it may be the case that you didn't pick it up because if you're reading it from the point of view that God does no wrong, and that's your hermeneutic, then often people's brain just doesn't see it. They just don't see the words and an evil spirit went from God to Saul or you know a lying spirit. And I love it because it's uh, in the image in Second Kings, I think it's... Uh, Maybe it's in the first Kings. So I should be careful. But there's an image where uh, where God's in sort of the 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 court of of God, and God's like, "Hey, who wants to volunteer to go down and deceive a bunch of prophets?" And uh, one of the spirits, one of the angels or whatever, steps up and says, "I'll do it. I'll become a deceptive spirit." So it's almost like God is sort of sending them in special forces style to disrupt the prophets. But this is a great example of how if we come at the text with a certain kind of hermeneutic, God doesn't calls people to lie, and God doesn't possess, send spirits to possess people to do bad things, like attack David, um, then we often don't, we just don't see them because we're not in a hermeneutical place to, to see them. Now let's shift to a specifically Christian context. What do the earliest Christian accounts of possession look like? So the earliest Christian accounts, of course, are the ones found in the, the New Testament. And so What's interesting about Jesus as an exorcist is that Jesus is very much like a lot of his Jewish exorcists of the time. Jews were famous as exorcists in, in the ancient world. In fact, in Josephus, there's a great story where um, 
uh, Josephus attends to an exorcism that's done in front of the Emperor Vespasian. Uh, a, Jewish a Jewish exorcist named Eliezer actually causes a demon to come out of a possessed man and uh, uh, I think even knocks over a bowl or something when the demon comes out of him. So if Jesus weren't known as the Messiah for the Christians, he would have been known as a pretty famous Galilean exorcist. And over about half of his miracles, depending on how you cut them up, actually come down to, uh, to exorcisms or healings via exorcism. So the earliest case of, an, of a Christian exorcist, of course, is, is Jesus. And we have accounts in the book of Acts where uh, Christians uh, were engaging in exorcism as well. And this wouldn't have been surprising because, again, we have several accounts from several Roman writers saying, look, if you have an exorcism problem, go to the Jews. The, the people in Syria, the Jews are pretty good at that kind of thing. And there was a general idea that the Jews were kind of good at magic and good at exorcisms in general. So those are our early cases, at least in the Christian world. Now, what's going to be interesting is that when we get into the Jewish world, of course, early Christians were all Jews. And what seems to happen in the divorce, I suppose we could say, between Judaism and Christianity is that Christianity is going to get exorcism. Judaism is going to basically abandon uh, the, entire pro the entire process, the entire ritual. And what we think happens is that for just about a thousand years, there's not a single narrative case of a Jewish exorcism in all of Jewish literature, probably because it becomes so heavily associated with Christianity that the Jews say, we don't want to be associated with this anymore. The Christians can have the exorcisms. Now, that's not to say that Jews weren't still dealing with demons. They had other technologies to deal with demons, but exorcism seems to have fallen by the wayside. In fact, we don't get another Jewish exorcism until, um, until the 16th century, which is... Uh, uh, astounding, where Jews go from being the world-renowned people in charge of exorcisms to they basically don't do it for a thousand years, beginning around the year 500. In pre-Christian tradition, you were talking about how possessions seem to be more so an affliction of the body rather than affliction of the soul. Did we still see that in, in Christian tradition, or, or do things change around the time of Christian influence developing? So you're right to point out that something does shift in the Christian understanding of what's going on in exorcism. And the big idea is the shift that exorcism, exorcism in the Christian world is now wrapped up into a very Christian specific uh, war, basically between uh, God and his angels and the devil and his demons. And what's happening as, as a kind of function of exorcism in the Christian context is that God is basically allowing possession to happen. And this is something that you get from, from Job, kind of, although there's no possession there. God simply allows Job's faith to be tested. But what basically happens is that God allows people to become possessed uh, as a test of their faith, but also a test of the faith of the people around them. And the devil is allowing demons to possess people as an outrage against God, but also as a mechanism to make people doubt um, their faith in God. Why would perfectly good people become possessed by these terrible demons? So it becomes very much wrapped up in this sort of God versus the devil war in which human beings are the battlefield. And our soul really is, is the battlefield. And so the, uh, the church develops a very, very interesting development of how possession happens and there are stages to it. One becomes uh, obsessed first and then one, and that opens the door to possession. And so the idea basically is that the devil can engage in these outrages and God basically allows it in order to test people's faith, but also for, to allow them to prove their faith. And of course, uh, the church being the mediator of, uh, of faith, the, one of the sacraments, of course, one of the, one of the lesser sacraments, of course, will become exorcism. And uh, there will be professional exorcists that operate all through the Christian world, all the way through the Middle Ages. In fact, what's interesting is that you can, uh, by the Middle Ages, you can perform an exorcism with less training than you could performing the Mass. So you could become uh, an exorcist with very little education, whereas performing the mass, basically you're engaging in a miracle, required a great deal more, um, great deal more education, and that's going to have interesting repercussions on the development of European magic, because many of the people performing the exorcists, they look if you can cast a demon out, maybe you can manipulate them in other ways too, and that's going to lead into an entire tradition of European Christian magic by basically manipulating demons, which. Uh, it's very colorful and interesting all in its own right. Okay, you've mentioned some, uh, let's call them innovations that uh, early Christians made to 
demonology and this kind of tradition. Can you tell me about the the innovations that uh, early heresiologists like Tertullian made to just the, the cultural framework surrounding uh, demonology? Well, they have to do with they have to do something with all the gods around them. Uh, this is a you know common problem that you know Judaism faced, and, and of course, uh, if you're going to be a monotheist, you got to do something with all these gods. And you have to do with something with the fact that there seem to be, even in the Bible, cases where non-Christians, non-Israelites, can do weird magic stuff. The most famous example being uh, Aaron and Moses with the staffs against the um, the Chartume Pharaoh. The, it's hard to translate what they were because their name means something like the ones from Khartoum, but we translate it as sorcerer, although it's not technically a Hebrew word for sorcerer. But they could throw their broads down and turn them into snakes. Well, the idea is, well, what do we do with all these other deities? What do we do with all these pagan deities? What do we do with all these daimons? Well, what ends up happening is, well, if you have to basically pick between two teams, God and the devil, well, the angels, we know from the Bible, they're on team God, everything else becomes on team devil. And so uh, all of the spirits, all of the daimones that existed in the Roman world, the Greek and Roman world, the, the, the sort of North African Carthaginian world that existed with the remains of the Phoenicians, everything gets flattened out into demons. And so we have all of these entities in the Hebrew Bible mentioned like Baal and Molach, they all become demons. Uh, and then of course, all of the other spirits and all the, the Roman gods also become demons as well. So that's one of the big innovations is sort of the pan demonization of, of all things that aren't especially, um, especially Christian. Um, what also happens is that there's an idea that um, the demons become especially harmful as you become more and more righteous. So if you think back to the really ancient world where, well, I get sick and you might be born with, you know, a congenital disease that made you blind or, or you might be, you know, born uh, in a way that makes you less, you know, less likely to, uh, to be healthy. In those cases, demon attacks are very random. They're very, they're just as random as getting sick is random, basically. Here, demons are actually much more interested in the souls of the righteous. Because again, think about their agenda. They're not just there to possess random people because random people are like who cares if like the shop you know the, the guy that fixes my shoes got possessed he might be a bad guy anyway he's like a drunk or whatever but if saint anthony gets possessed he's a righteous guy living in the desert he's dedicated his whole life to god and if the devil can overcome him maybe a lot of people will lose their faith and so one of the big ideas that develops at the same time that monasticism is developing is that the demons really are uh targeting the righteous and so you get a lot of these stories where people who are very, very righteous are the most targeted by demonic powers. And so that's an idea where demon, demon attacks go from just sort of random to, um, to really righteous people. Also, you also see this happen not just with righteous people, but also with people who are thought to be especially innocent. And this will be people like uh, young children, especially girls because virginal girls, of course, are seen as signs of purity, and typically they will become possessed and do outrageous sexual sins. And the idea is, if God will allow this you know, flower of innocence to be defiled, um, what kind of God is that? Maybe the God doesn't exist or God can't protect them. And that imagery has persisted all the way down to movies like The Exorcist, where a, a young, you know, early pubescent girl is possessed and commits all kinds of shocking uh, sexual acts as an outrage against God. And so that, that motif has persisted, persisted all the way down into, into, into modernity. So it sounds like accusations of demonic activity or just narratives of demonic activity was uh, a bit of a political tool for the, the, the religious uh, folks that were in power. Do we see other instances of you know, demons being invoked for, for political reasons in Christian antiquity? I think that, I mean, it's, I can't think of an example where demons in, in particularly in, in Christian antiquity are being invoked as like people claiming other people are possessed. I mean, you're getting a lot of claims that people are the Antichrist in, in the high Middle Ages and in the Protestant Reformation, of course, that the Pope is possessed and he's the Antichrist. I think that socio-politically, the way that possession often function, and also we just don't get a lot of possession cases through the early Middle Ages and through the, through the apostolic, uh, the later apostolic period. You don't see a ton of cases. Um, but what you do get are cases, especially when women become possessed, where they act out in ways that you would not normally see a woman being allowed to act out in. 
folks. So for instance, she might accuse people of having engaged in sexual impropriety, uh, sometimes with her. You may see her being able to preternaturally know who's sinned. Of course, demons would know who sinned, but also anyone in a village full of rumor mongering people knows who's sinning. And so this allows a situation, this will be true in Judaism and Islam as well. This allows a situation where a disenfranchised person, typically a woman, is allowed to basically say a bunch of things that she would never be allowed to say under the guise of being ostensibly possessed. And so this is an interesting case where it could be the case where the person does believe they're possessed. I'm not sure that they were. It's not for me to say. It's a metaphysical question. But once you are possessed, you become unresponsible for the things that you've done and the things that you say. And this gives people enormous amounts of freedom to speak their mind and act in ways they would otherwise know not be able to act. And this is a trope we see happening again and again and again, especially with the possession of children and women, uh, young girls, uh, and things like that. But you'd be surprised that, um, unsurprisingly, lots of possession cases early on, but as Christianity gets more and more and more powerful, less and less and less possession cases. Now, I think that a cynical read of that, but maybe not a completely cynical read of that is, Christianity just doesn't have the kind of enemies that it had before. And as it loses those enemies, it begins to feel itself relatively triumphant, and you just don't have much in the way of uh, the devil accosting people in the same ways. Uh, although you do have outbreaks, there are famous outbreaks in the Middle Ages where entire nunneries um, um, get possessed. A Ludun uh, possession case is a famous one where there was a mass outbreak of possession that happened at a, a nunnery. So you see these, and these spread very much like other kinds of hysterical events, like hysterical dancing that happened in the Middle Ages or the witch trials and, and things like that. So you do have outbreaks, but it's actually significantly less. And it's interestingly enough that when the Protestant out, the Protestant Revolution happens, you get a lot of outbreaks. And in fact, it's around that time that the Ritule Romanum becomes standardized uh, and it becomes, um, that's the ritual you see being used in the, in the exorcism rituals. Um, in fact, exorcism manuals in the Middle Ages were kind of a cottage industry. There were lots of different versions of them. And the, uh, the, um, the Counter-Reformation really uh, nails that ritual down. So it's during that period that you see another outbreak of possession cases in tandem with the, um, the early modern witch trials. Okay, a final question here. If one wanted to become possessed in Christian antiquity, what would they do to make that happen? I guess there are a couple ways of doing it. Being a young, you know, being a young girl is, I guess, one way of making yourself more likely to, to be possessed. Um, I suppose if you really wanted to be possessed, you probably had to work pretty hard at being a pretty good Christian. So I'd, I would suggest that if you want to be possessed, go be a monk out in Egypt, become very, very pious. And then when the demons show up, which they inevitably will, um, just welcome home, boys. I don't know. Like you could just welcome them on in. So it's an ironic thing that um, unlike in Judaism, where possession eventually will happen primarily by the evil dead, one of the things that we should mention here is that uh, after the 16th century, demons no longer possess Jewish people. Uh, evil dead people do, what are called dibiks. So dibik possession becomes the principal form of possession in the, in the, Jew, in the Jewish world. Uh, jinn possession is the principal mechanism in the Islamic world. But in the Christian world, primarily, it is, um, at least in the early Christian world, the Catholic world, uh, you're most likely to be visited by a demonic being if you were especially righteous. So and that's not to say that random possessions don't happen, but if you want to for sure uh, attract the, the attention of demons, go be a monk in the desert for 10 years. Uh, I'm not sure either side of that's worth it. Um, or go stand on top of a pillar for a while or something, um, as some of those folks did. But um, yeah, I think that uh, if you want to, if you really want to attract the demons, if you know, to really radio them in, um, go be a desert father. Well, if you get a rather blasphemous email from me in about 10 years, uh, with an attachment, a, a photo of me looking quite uh, sunburned, then you'll know what's happened and it will be your fault, Justin. Hey, you know, if you do all of the, the spiritual athleticism of moving to Egypt and living in, the, in a cave in the desert, uh, and then you were like, welcome them in, welcome them in. I don't, um, I don't know, man. You may, you may be responsible for that for yourself. Um, but um, yeah, exorcisms and, and these kinds of things are fascinating. I've, I've, I've been to some exorcisms. Uh, I've, I've been personally at them and they're very weird and very interesting and possession is just a fascinating um, part of what it is to be human. 
Um, again, I'll mention another example in Judaism, where uh, Judaism is unique among the Abrahamic religions, where we also maintained or continue to maintain uh, the idea that one can become uh, possessed by the righteous, the righteous dead. Now, uh, this is called ibor. It means to become pregnant. And there are still customs where people sleep overnight on the tombs of the righteous to become uh, possessed by the spirits of the righteous uh, for, for temporary uh, mystical power. So this concept of possession both by good and evil spirits is just a, a long-standing, fascinating topic in the, in the history of what it is uh, to be in the, the Abrahamic religions, but also just, uh, I think, probably what it is to be human in general. Well, thank you so much for coming on and exploring that with me. Hopefully people learn some things. And uh, I, I think that this video in particular is really going to attract an audience that would specifically enjoy your content. I mean, just, I, I don't know if any other channel has as many, and especially not as many high quality videos about possession, exorcism, demonology, satanic panic as, as yours. So people definitely need to go check that out after they get done watching this one. Yeah, I would love for folks to come check out Esoterica. You know, it's a whole channel where we uh, explore the arcane and history, philosophy, and religion. And of course, the the world of the demonic and the world of the spiritual and how it interacts with our world is part and parcel of that of that study. So yeah, we have long uh, episodes really diving deep into the text around um, these kinds of these kinds of topics. All right, up next, let's get into current Christian tradition on the subject. For this, I'll speak to Dr. Joseph Laycock, a professor of religious studies at Texas State University who specializes in new religious movements. He's written some incredibly valuable popular level books on satanic panics, possession and exorcism, and Satanism. I highly recommend his work for anyone interested in diving deeper into the subjects we'll discuss, so I'll link some of his books in the description. So let's jump in. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for joining me. I've really enjoyed reading through your work, so I'm excited to have you on the channel. Let's start with, in Christianized cultures today, what does possession look like? Like, what is possession today? Right, so if you go back to the Gospels, which are the earliest accounts of possession in the Christian tradition, most of the people that Jesus is casting spirits out of are mute or lame, or there is some physical malady with them. It's only the so-called Gerasene demoniac story, which appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where the person is exhibiting supernatural strength and cutting themselves and saying, my name is Legion. Uh, but that one example kind of became the ur-type for what possession is supposed to look like uh, in the Christian tradition. So, in the Catholic tradition, the signs of possession are uh, superhuman strength, uh, speaking in tongue someone has never studied, sometimes called a, a xenoglossy, knowing things that would be impossible for a human being uh, uh, to know. Uh, and then the easiest one to fake is uh, blasphemous rage. So uh, having violent uh, reactions to uh, uh, things like uh, holy water uh, or uh, uh, Latin prayers. And then in the Protestant tradition, uh, things look similar, but there are subtle differences. So for example, possessed Protestants usually don't have a problem with holy water because they don't associate that as being part of their tradition. Uh, but things like reading the Bible, uh, which we would be much more likely to sort of trigger that, uh, that blasphemous rage uh, reaction. It sounds like uh, the possessed tend to respond to the exorcist that comes from the same tradition that they're familiar with. Am I, am I getting that right? Is that a trend? Yeah, uh, Brian Levac is a historian of exorcism, especially in, in early modern Europe. And, and what he suggested is wh whatever else exorcism is, whether we think this is a case of mental illness or this is just someone acting, or even if this is actually a, a, a demon, uh, it, it seems to be a script, right? It's a sort of cultural script that people learn from their culture how you act when you are possessed. Uh, and this is why he would say uh, different religions and even different denominations of Christianity uh, get possessed in different ways, right? Because this is heavily informed by, by culture. They are taught how to act this way and how to respond to certain cues. Now, I know that in the past, exorcism has not always looked like just trying to get these spirits to leave. They're, they're evil and we have to get them just completely away from this person. It's looked different before. But now, 
is is that right? Am I getting that right? That exorcism today in Christian traditions is just like, leave this person alone, never come back. You're evil. We're not going to appease you. We're just expelling you. We're evicting you from the property. Yeah. So if we look at exorcism across cultures and, and not just Christianity, uh, in many traditions, it's much more common to sort of first figure out what sort of spirit this is and then what it's going to take to get it to leave. So in Japan, which has a very rich tradition of exorcism, it could be that the spirit is just a fox spirit and it just wants some rice balls or something. And if you give it those things, it will, it will leave you alone. Uh, in the Christian tradition, though, uh, the idea is that possessing spirits are always demons. They're always basically, uh, you know, fallen angels or something like this that is the enemy of God and the enemy of all mankind. And so they have to be dealt with aggressively. We know that historically, uh, Christians did all kinds of things to get rid of demons. So that by the time of the Protestant Reformation, it seems that if you were living in a village in Europe and you thought you needed an exorcism, you might go to a priest, but you might also go to, you know, a village wise woman, right, who would maybe anoint you with oil or, or use some kind of folk remedy. And the, the Protestants said, uh, look how silly this all is. This is Catholic magic. Catholics are using rituals that are nowhere found in the Bible. And in, in the Bible, Jesus and his apostles just sort of cast demons out. And the Catholic Church responded to this and said, you know what? You're right. We're going to make official rules for exorcism. And that was compiled in the Ritual Romanum, which was published in 1614. And that ritual of exorcism is still basically the one used today. Uh, it can only be performed by priests with the approval of a bishop. Uh, so it really reigns in what can happen in an exorcism and who is authorized uh, uh, to do one. That ritual was reformed in 1999 uh, as part of the, um, the reforms of Vatican II, which happened in the 60s. And one of the reforms uh, that certain priests asked for is they said, you know, if we yell at someone, you know, get out devil and things like that, we are suggesting you are the devil. And so wouldn't it be better if the wording just sort of emphasized God is going to take care of you because you're, you're, you're God's creature, if it was sort of more, more positive. Uh, and so the new ritual, I understand, did change the language a little bit about that. But people like Gabrielle Amorth, uh, who is now the subject of a film where Russell Crowe will play this famous Catholic exorcist named Gabrielle Amorth, uh, said, this new exorcism sucks <laughs> He called it a blunt sword, uh, and and so he sort of lobbied for permission to keep using uh, the old school uh, version of it. So that's what it would look like in the Catholic tradition. And then outside of the Catholic tradition, uh, it can be very uh, inventive, right? There are cases of people using um, various products like blessed oil or even things like vinegar and, and bleach. Who are again, These are Christians just kind of spontaneously... Uh, uh, doing this, uh, urging people in the congregation to spit into cups or vomits, and this is supposed to be kind of spirits leaving their their body. Uh, so religion on the ground is very messy and very kind of ad hoc and very inventive. So if you go into uh, a Pentecostal or an evangelical church, and they'll usually call it deliverance ministry, not an exorcism, uh, you might see any number of things kind of depending on uh, who is leading that particular church. It sounds like there was a more of a free market approach to uh, exorcism traditions, and then it became centralized when when Catholics decided to respond to Protestants and say, "Yeah, we we should get our stuff together and and just have one way of doing this rather than it being, uh, let's say, community sourced." Right. Right, and when you study the history of religions, you really notice how political all of this is, right? What motivates changes to exorcism practices is um, how will this make my church look uh, against my competitors, right? Other other churches. And uh, uh, how, what, what can I do? What services can I offer uh, that will, will bring in more people to my church instead of brand X? Uh, so in the United States, the Catholic Church initially was very embarrassed by exorcism because uh, Catholics in America were considered to be this kind of superstitious immigrant religion. But after the movie The Exorcist came out in 1973, everybody wanted an exorcism and if the Catholic Church wouldn't give it to them, 
they were going to go the Pentecostals or they were going to go the Evangelicals. So now the Catholic Church has pretty much completely reversed its stance. And it's now much, much easier to get an exorcism from the Catholics than it would have been in the 1960s. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that specifically. So in preparation for this, I was reading some of your work and came across this idea that I actually wasn't aware of that exorcism was increasingly rare after the kind of first American satanic panic in the in the witch trials in both America and Europe in the 17th century. Uh, but at a certain point in the 20th century, it like exploded back onto the scene. What 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 happened there? Yeah, I mean nobody really knows, right? But uh, by the you know 1700s, there were Christians basically saying uh, the devil is not part of uh, of Christianity, right? Yeah, it talks about a devil in the Bible, but that's that's metaphorical, right? For, forget about the the devil. Uh, and in the 1960s, there were even prominent Catholic theologians writing books saying the devil uh, uh, is not real. Uh, and in the 1960s, there was um, the rise of the the secularization narrative. So in other words, everybody in the 60s felt um, religion has got maybe a couple good years left. But basically, we're right on the verge of becoming this highly secular sort of Star Trek-like uh, a, a situation. And maybe it was because of that belief that in the 60s, we saw this big turn towards anything having to do with the paranormal or neo-paganism. This is the beginning of uh, the Church of Satan, right? Founded in 1966. So anything having to do with demons or witchcraft, people are suddenly uh, uh, really into. And I think that's why William Peter Blatty was given a book contract to write The Exorcist and why it was eventually uh, a kind of a, a successful uh, a film. Uh, but it seems almost like the, the belief that religion and the supernatural were dying both caused the demand for something like The Exorcist and also made it scarier because part of the fear of The Exorcist is it's fine if religion dies out if demons aren't real. But if yeah. demons are real and we've gotten rid of all the priests, then we're totally screwed. And I think mm -hmm. that's part of what audiences were reacting to in 1973. I was wondering if there was an interaction between the pop culture, uh, bits of pop culture that were depicting exorcism and actual cases of, you know, claimed possession and exorcism. So Carl Sagan in The Demon Haunted World talks about how accounts of abduction, alien abduction, kind of mirror popular media about aliens that were coming out in the early, mid 20th century. Do we see something similar with possession? Do, do people watch, you know, horror movies that started to get really popular around the 1970s and, and think, huh, OK, maybe I'm possessed like in the movie. Maybe I need an exorcist like in the movie. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. And in fact, I have a book coming out called The Exorcist Effect, uh, specifically uh, looking at this. But we know even from priests who appeared in the film, director William Friedkin liked to cast non-actors. Uh, and so a lot of the priests in The Exorcist are actually priests. The medical staff are actually medical staff and so forth. And the priest who appeared in the movie said, as soon as the, the movie came out, I started getting nonstop calls from people who said that they were possessed. And of course, most priests in the 1970s, and this is still true today, have never done an exorcism, right? And have no idea kind of how to go about doing that. It is still something that's largely not supposed to happen, and especially was in 1973. Uh, I also found cases of, um, you know, young young kids who were just beginning to develop um, things like epilepsy and thought that what was happening to them was demonic possession because of all the talk uh, uh, generated from, from the film. Uh, and then by the time we get to the satanic panic in the 1980s, People are trying to recover repressed memories of satanic abuse, and they're mostly remembering these, these films. So the kind of ur text in that is Michelle Remembers, which was produced by the psychiatrist and his patient. And in that book, where the psychiatrist has hypnotized this woman and she's supposedly regressing to the age of five and remembering these satanic rituals, she says, uh, oh, they, they brought in this one lady and uh, her head moves funny and spins around and she throws up a lot, right? <laughs> Which if anyone has seen The Exorcist or even bits and pieces of it, it's pretty obvious where these images are coming from, right? It's not a memory, it's, it's the film. 
that brings me to another topic that I, or another question that I wanted to ask you. I noticed when I have read accounts of exorcism, it's kind of rarely men and especially adult men. It's, it's mostly young, vulnerable women and then children uh, to a lesser extent. Is that a pattern that you've observed too? Am I, am I seeing something that's real there or is this just my own like selection bias? So this is a known pattern across cultures. Uh, women get possessed more than men. And this is true not just in, in Christian cultures, but, but around the world. And there are a couple of different theories to account for this. Um, one is a gender essentialist theory. Um, so it posits that women's brains are just different uh, than men's. I'm not endorsing the theory necessarily, but I'll, I'll explain it. Um, it. It goes like this, that women are basically better at creating a, a theory of mind So not only kind of um, understanding how they see the situation, but also being able to imagine how other people see the situation. The argument here is that the reason in a sort of a heteronormative couple why the wife always remembers birthdays and anniversaries and the the man doesn't is there's sort of this greater uh, capacity for uh, thinking about other people. And this means the brain actually has the... um, uh, the extra wiring to basically run two personalities at the same time, right? That if you are, if you're sort of emotionally dead, uh, you're not going to be able to kind of effectively have a second personality. Now, I'm not endorsing this theory, but it's it's in the, the literature. Another theory uh, is called the social deprivation theory, and the idea here is that basically in many cultures, women are just ignored. Uh, no one takes them seriously or cares what they have to say unless they are in a state of possession. Uh, and we can th- certainly find cases throughout history of this in the Christian tradition. Uh, there was a peasant girl named Martha Brassier, and she became basically a professional uh, a demoniac. And basically different sort of political figures in France uh, would, would do exorcisms and sort of coax the demons into giving, you know, political proclamations about the order of the day. And she got the attention of the, the king of France, right? So I got to do something about this woman because she keeps saying these things. Um, so, th- so that could be one reason for it. Uh, and I think the other is you know, kind of the, the flip side of that is if you already have a lot of power, uh, people may accuse you of being possessed by a demon, but if they can't do anything about it, you are free to sort of ignore them. Uh, so that may be another reason why it's mostly women and children uh, who, who undergo exorcism. In reading your work before this, I came across this case where a woman seemed to somewhat exert some power over her exorcist in that when he would come to exorcise her, you know, they would they would get closer. And then when he would leave, do other work for the church, she would write him letters in the personality of the demon and be like, you know, screw you, you suck. Come back here. Come take care of me. You should never leave me. And of course, you know, I see this from a, a, my own naturalistic perspective and, and think she's wielding power over this man that if if she did this outside of this context would be incredibly inappropriate, especially when he is a, a man of the cloth, right? So I, I look at this case and, and think that it's she's exercising power. It's a creative way of exercising power. I mean, is that way off? No, I think that's that's absolutely right. And that's another pattern that we can see again and again throughout uh, uh, a history. Um, and in fact, in the early modern period, there are a lot of women who begin as demoniacs. And once they become famous demoniacs, uh, sort of transition into being mystics and holy women, right? And, and get this sort of uh, a privilege for being uh, especially holy and for getting power over men. Uh, I think the best example of this uh, was the the case written up by uh, Aldous Huxley as the Devils of Ludun, which was about an entire convent of nuns that became possessed. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of mother superior of the convent uh, was interested in this sexy new priest who had come to their village and said, uh, I would like him to be our confessor, right? Because they're not allowed to leave the convent. So this is the only man that they ever get to talk to. And he basically turned down the job. And then she said, well, he's a sorcerer, right? And he is, he is sending us uh, erotic dreams about him and we, with his sorcery. Uh, and the priest was burned at the stake, right? Largely because he, he basically spurned the wrong 
uh, a woman. So those power dynamics happen, and exorcism is very frequently, because it is such an intimate practice, caught up with kind of illicit relationships uh, in the same way that therapy often is, uh, and even more so because you're always free to say, well, you know, it wasn't me seducing the exorcist, right? It was the demon. And even the exorcist can say, it was the supernatural guiles of a succubus or something, right? How was I supposed to resist that? It's not, it's not my fault. Uh, so there has been um, uh, discussions of there really ought to be a, a chaperone, right? If you're going to have a, a man exercising a, a woman, that should not happen uh, behind closed doors with, with nobody else present. So in preparing for this interview, I came across this quote that was in uh, a work that you edited and, and compiled. It was the account of an exorcist on a Native American uh, Yakima res reservation in 1977. There's this quote that I wanted to get your opinion on. It was by the, uh, I believe, psychologist who was writing about the case. They said, Acting out of demonology beliefs occurs only in times where there is social oppression and loss of social integration. Modern demonology can be seen to be a part of the social repudiation of the scientific determinism of rational man, coincident with the rise in existential irrationalism. Now, a, a bit wordy, and I'm wondering if you can unpack that a bit for me. Yeah, so this was a... a a really interesting case. And to get the rights to publish that, uh, I had to track down uh, the son of this psychiatrist. Uh, and they actually are interested in making a, a movie about this case. But basically, as a psychiatrist, he was a medical doctor. He was assigned to the Yakima uh, Reservation, mostly to deal with, I think, ordinary uh, health issues as, as were needed. And a woman brought in her daughter, uh, a Yakima woman brought in her daughter who was experiencing hallucinations and things like this. And in the 70s, psychiatrists were all Freudians. Uh, and so he had this theory of, well, your daughter is hallucinating because uh, you are sexually jealous of your daughter becoming a woman and you've somehow transferred your feelings onto her and so forth. He didn't tell them any of this. He just said, you know, what do you think is going on with your daughter? And they said, well, I think the spirits want her to become a, a, a shaman, but we want her to go to college. We don't want her to be a shaman. And he just said, well, what do your people normally do in that situation? And they said, well, I guess there's a ritual we could all do and just tell the spirits to, to leave her alone. And he said, as your psychiatrist, I think you should do that ritual. And it worked. It, it was effective. And so he comments about how psychiatry is really just our culture's form of shamanism. It sort of depends on the authority of the psychiatrist. Uh, and shamanism is really a, a form of psychiatry as, as well. And he notes in, the, in that quote that uh, what seems to be at stake here is a culture in transition, right? The, the Yakima has a traditional way of doing things, but there's an awareness that sort of adopting Western values could be useful for the kind of financial uh, well-being of, of the next generation. So they're at sort of a crossroads, and exorcism becomes a way of talking about that, that crossroads. What's interesting, though, is this is in 1971. This is the year the exorcist a novel comes out. And really, uh, American society as a whole is at a similar crossroads of kind of thinking about um, if religion is really dying out, what's our future without religion going to, to look like? Uh, and having this kind of anxiety, right? Imagining our sort of religious past and our scientific future and, uh, and how is this all going to play out? And, and the, the kind of fascination with demons and exorcisms is actually sweeping all of America at that time. So when social dynamics are such that people are experiencing somewhat of a, a loss of identity or at least feel some kind of uh, like culturally or existentially threatened, is it that they might adopt this social script in order to make sense or this cultural script to make sense of what is going on around them and maybe feel a, a kind of existential security in that they have a connection to their culture and to the people around them through this ritual? Yeah, so, so if we look at exorcism historically, exorcism doesn't track with the level of scientific knowledge that a culture has. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you can be kind of at a very low level of scientific advancement and have basically no exorcism. And then you can look at our culture, which is in theory very scientifically advanced, and exorcism is probably much bigger now uh, than it has been in, in, in centuries. Uh, so the pattern seems to be it's not about 
sort of technology or science, it's about how quickly the society is changing. If there is a sense that things are changing too much too fast, there seems to be a turn towards uh, uh, exorcism as kind of um, both a, a way of explaining misfortune, right? A way of kind of saying, why is this happening to me? Why are things not the way I feel they ought to be? Well, it's because of the spirits, right? Or it's because of demons, or it's because of witches. It's because of people in league uh, with the demons. And the other thing that this does is it's very good for scapegoating and sort of um, shoring up this sense of, no, 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 there is a right way for society to be. And it must be this way because outside of this is the demons and the witches and why would they try so hard to destroy what we're doing uh, unless this was really the way that, that things need to be. In Christian antiquity, there was quite a political bent, let's say, when it came to accusations of possession and then exorcist activity. Is that still true today? Are, are people claiming that others are possessed or in league with Satan for political reasons? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think exorcism has always been very uh, uh, political. Uh, but if you look at uh, things like QAnon, um, QAnon may not be an explicitly a supernatural register, but certainly saying that you know, the liberal elites are Satanists who drink human blood, <laughs> right? To get the adrenochrome uh, is, is basically a, a kind of demonic uh, a register. And, you know, Roger Stone understands that this is effective. Roger Stone, of course, is a political fixer and has done things like said, well, there's a portal to hell uh, open over Biden's White House, right? And, and you can go to D.C. and you can see it uh, uh, for yourself. He wouldn't say something so ridiculous unless he knew that this would work, right? Some people would be kind of uh, uh, persuaded by this. So I think uh, the language of uh, possession and exorcism is always going to be politically useful because it is a kind of intellectual laziness. If you can persuade your audience that, you know, my opponent is just in league with the devil, then you don't need to get into all the, you know, details of why this policy is better than that policy and, and, and so forth. It's just categorically evil with a capital E. Yeah, it definitely is easier to debate with, you know, Lucian Greaves, the uh, one of the main spokespeople for the Satanic Temple, if you are constantly asserting that he drinks the, the blood of children uh, rather than, you know, engaging him on what he actually says. It's really interesting to watch him debate Tucker Carlson and Tucker Carlson will say things like crawl back into your hole and die. Thanks so much for being on our show. Which is totally passable if, you know, he's using the language of Satanism regardless of his actions, right? Yeah, I actually think that's partly why there is such a, a, a visceral reaction to the Satanic Temple uh, is because they do things like uh, charity work and it's, it's sort of taking away this big stick of uh, the evil Satanists, right? The, the critics, Christian critics of the Satanic Temple, as opposed to other critics of the Satanic Temple, uh, are more upset about them doing good works in philanthropy <laughs> than they are about them identifying as, as Satanists, right? When they say they're not totally evil, they say, well, then you're not really Satanists. You're, you're just trolling then. Well, it's taking away the cultural script that they, they know and, and cling to, and that's challenging to their identity in a way. Exactly. You actually have to be a good person because of your actions, not simply because of your tribal affiliation. Yeah, that's that's what's uh, uh, challenging about, about the Satanists. All right. In wrapping up here, now, if I wanted to become possessed, let's say hypothetically, how would I go about doing that in a Christian context today? Well, you know, I think for... Uh, Christians who think about uh, exorcism a lot, uh, getting possessed is ridiculously easy, <laughs> right? Uh, I think it was Ed and Lorraine Warren who coined this term, uh, the law of invitation, that you must somehow invite a, a demon into you. Uh, so certainly if you were to like turn out all the lights and light a candle and say something like, demons, I invite you to enter me, that would certainly fit the bill. Uh, but the Warrens would say that there's actually all sorts of ways to accidentally and unintentionally invite demons into you, which could be anything from taking a yoga class, uh, reading a Harry Potter book, playing with the Ouija board, or even things like owning DVDs of horror movies in your house. 
Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really more a question of how would you not get possessed, not how would you go about doing it on purpose. Maybe I should do a segment or right after this interview concludes and just do a little, uh, this possession uh, is brought to you by Hasbro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would love to see a clip of you, you know, doing yoga on top of a Ouija board while reading Harry Potter or something like that, you know, see how you can um, optimize this. You know, if you get into YouTube, I'm going to have some competition because that's a fantastic idea for a conclusion for a video. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. I am excited to to try this out and see if if your ideas for how I can become possessed will work. Uh, if not, then I guess at least I've I've learned some things from this. Well, you're in Texas, so there's exorcists all over, so you'll be in good hands if if anything goes wrong. Well, I don't quite have the time to go buy a Ouija board or a Harry Potter book before releasing this video, but maybe I'll make a short where I take Dr. Laycock's suggestion. Would you guys like to see that? For now, instead, let's run through the risk factors for possession from across Christian history and see if there really is a chance I'm possessed. For extra fun, play along from home to see if you might be harboring some evil spirits. Sickness. Well, I do have a chronic illness, and we've known this since childhood, so maybe I've been possessed this whole time. Mental illness. Uh, I wouldn't say that I have a mental illness. I am somewhat neurodivergent, like dyslexic and kind of ADHD. So I don't know. Maybe? Maybe I qualify here? I have some teachers who would probably say so. Theological disagreement with orthodoxy. Uh, I mean, I have theological disagreement with anyone who believes that theology is about like things that are not made up so <laughs> yeah yeah that's me being spiritually pure or innocent hmm i actually think that some of my non-religious friends would say that i definitely qualify as like very pure and somewhat innocent uh i'm a i'm a, I'm a pretty chill person but um no i i don't think under any standards that would be set by conservative religious people that I am I am pure enough. I, I read too many blasphemous books. Political opposition to orthodoxy. I think that the fact that running this channel is my full-time job uh, tells you all you need to know about that. Yes. Being a young woman. Finally, one that I don't qualify for. Being an indigenous person who hasn't fully assimilated into the culture of colonizers. I think that I would count as the descendants of the colonizers. My family came here to uh, take really cheap land from the government in the 1800s and used to belong to indigenous people, so. And finally, involvement with the occult. I don't really dabble in any spiritual practices or ritual, but I did go to a Rotting Christ concert a couple weeks ago, and judging by some of their lyrics, which are in Hebrew, Latin, Greek, casting crazy blasphemous spells from the stage, uh, I think that that counts risk factor for being possessed for sure. Yeah, I qualify for almost all of those. So maybe the commenters are right. Maybe I am possessed. Should I, should I be making some calls telling some people to get tested or, but what about you guys? How many of these risk factors do you meet? And has anyone ever accused you of being possessed before? Maybe after you expressed a certain dissenting opinion in a YouTube comment section, <laughs> let me know in the comments. With that, thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. If you want to hear more from me, then subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.